Good afternoon and welcome to Facebook Live. This is Dr. Bill Bird, Chief Medical Officer at CGH Medical Center in Sterling, Illinois. Thank you for taking the time to join me uh, in this uh, broadcast. So I'm going to tell you what we're going to do here during this broadcast. I'm going to give you a brief update on uh, COVID-related issues. We're going to have Sherry DeWalt from, from the Foundation come in and talk a little bit about our Growing Healthy series and introduce our topic today. Um, and I'm not even going to say what the topic is because I'm going to let Sherry be the one to introduce us and that topic. So now, as you're kind of on bated breath of what the topic's going to be, let's get into a, a brief pandemic update. Matt has a few graphs that we're going to show you. So this is, yeah, May 6th, uh, our, our case count, 166, low transmission. So that's definitely looking better. I think you can go backwards, can't you, Matt? Let's see what you have. Ah, okay, 13th. We keep going, Matt. We went up to 342 that part of May. Keep going. 230, 154. Yes, I think. Keep going. 232, medium, say five, low. And do we have any others, Matt, or is that it? That may be it. So you can kind of see that we kind of bounced up a little bit in like mid to, to late May. And now we're seems like we're settling into um, a lower number of cases uh, every every um, yeah every seven days. So that's good. Low is good. Encouraged by that. Uh, thanks, Matt. Just a few little, just a couple uh, facts. So you probably saw or may have seen in the news about the variants of the variants of the variants. In this case, BA point uh, four and BA point five. There's not quite as much of an antibody response to those variants of um, Omicron as compared to others in terms of if you've been vaccinated or if you've had the infection before, if you've had both based upon a study that was done in the New England Journal of Medicine. So that fits with what we're seeing. We're seeing some reinfections or people that get infected that were fully vaccinated or have had an infection uh, from another variant in the past. Really to be expected, the good news though is for those people who have been fully vaccinated in particular and those who've had an infection and uh, also been fully vaccinated, by and large, folks aren't getting really, really sick and ending up in the hospital. I do see folks uh, that when they get it, do feel pretty sick for a while, um, but most people don't. And that's great news, at least at this moment. So that's that I wanted to share with you. Um, and U.S. cases uh, in this past two weeks are down about 13%. So now we're seeing about a little less than 100,000 cases a day which if you break down the numbers is about one in every 3,400 of us is getting infected every day. So, I mean, you, people are definitely getting infected and I'm sure you know those around you who are, uh, but the numbers are uh, much better than they were previously. So message on COVID is, is has it as it has been and continues to be, be smart about it, live your life, get fully vaccinated. And if you get sick and you happen to be at someone who's at high risk, um, then I would encourage you definitely to seek out to your healthcare uh, provider to get either that Paxlovid, which is the oral pill or monoclonal antibodies to try to make you help keep you from getting too sick. So yeah, that's kind of where we're at right now with COVID. And I'll take any questions throughout the course of this broadcast, but, but right now I am going to kick it over to Sherry DeWalt and Sherry is gonna talk um, about the topic today and about some foundation news. So Sherry, it's all yours. Hi, yes. Um, so you know that the topic today is sexual health for both men and women. And uh, Dr. Song is going to be joining Dr. Bird for that topic. And I don't think it's one that we've ever uh, discussed before. So it should be really interesting. Next month in July, um, Dr. Hatoum from the uh, Northern Illinois Cancer Treatment Center will be joining Dr. Bird to talk about uh, new advances in radiation oncology, and that will be on Thursday, July 21st. And I also wanted to mention um, the Health Foundation every year has a specific uh, campaign, and this year we're focusing on Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, and we have a lot of great projects in the works um, to help uh, those who are 
caregiving for people with dementia and Alzheimer's. And uh, this coming Tuesday on the 28th, we're going to be doing an open forum, a public forum, and we will have some exhibitors there uh, at 530. This is going to be at Bethel Reformed Church in Sterling. Um, probably 10 or 12 exhibitors, uh, people who provide services to caregivers. Um, and then uh, starting at uh, six o'clock, we will have a couple of speakers. That will be Dr. Preeti Joseph um, from our neurology department. And she's going to be talking about dementia and treatment of dementia. Um, and we're partnering in this program with the Alzheimer's Association. And um, so Joe Landmichael from the Alzheimer's Association is going to be there talking also about resources. Uh, so that would be a great one if you, uh, we all know somebody who is affected uh, and this is open to the public and uh, we would like you to register so we have an idea of how many people are coming. And um, you can go to uh, the CGH website, www.cghmc.com backslash forum to find the registration. And with that, I will let Dr. Bird take over again. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah, the foundations, uh, one of their their one of their points of emphasis is, is dementia this year. There are so many, you know, through the years, um, you know, family members or friends uh, who who have or have had dementia. So great opportunity to be kicked that off with this forum and encourage folks to take part in that. And there are gonna be other things coming up in terms of, of dementia that the foundation is doing throughout the year. But today, different topic. And I am so glad to have Dr. Song on again. She, she's always, she's one of our, our um, fan favorites to have on. Hi, Dr. Song. <laughs> um, so this is an interesting talk and, and I'm, um, so the backstory on this and I'm, uh, it was that we were gonna have a talk on men's, men's health. That's how it started. And as we got, to, as we got to talking about it, Dr. Song was like, and sexual health for men and those type of things. Dr. Song was like, you know, there's, we probably should talk about women's sexual health too. And I'm like, yeah, that's probably a good idea. So I'm excited. I'm a little anxious about this uh, interview because I, this is one of those topics that is, it's part of life, but it's also one of those things that we don't tend to talk about a whole lot. So I'm glad we have the opportunity to do that. Dr. Song, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. So and, and we're glad that you're you look nice and very so on your if you guys could have been part of our with, with Dr. Song and, and duct taping her camera just so it's all set now, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, all, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. All right. So the roadmap for, for our, our conversation today is we are going to talk about some men's health like issues and but we're going to weave women into that conversation and then we're also going to go into some women's oh there's marianne saying hi dr song <laughs> um and then we're going to go into some women's uh, related sexual health issues as we go forward in our conversation so let me let me start with a one that would kind of be typical that we'd ask and that is what is erectile dysfunction <clears throat> and what causes it? Uh, erectile dysfunction is, I'm sorry if my voice goes in and out, but ED or erectile dysfunction is basically when a male cannot have an erection that is um, satisfactory for intercourse. So <clears throat> you can have like grade one, meaning like it's very firm, but it's not as firm as it used to be and they can still have intercourse or like grade four where it's completely flaccid and it's not erect enough for um, intercourse and penetration. So ED, just like all medical conditions, is on a spectrum where there's early and then there's more severe. But um, depending on your age, there are certainly different things that can affect uh, uh, men's sexual health, especially with ED. But when you're younger, uh, it could be something with like low testosterone. It could be maybe like antidepressants. Mm -hmm. um, it could be something maybe like uh, uh, pelvic injury. <clears throat> um, when you're older, you can have things like hypertension, diabetes, um, cardiovascular problems. So the, the, the vessels that go to the penis are five times smaller than the vessels that go to your heart. And so when you have um, problems going, the vessels going to the penis, then it may foretell future cardiac problems like 10 years later. Mm -hmm. So they're all related. 
Um, you know, diabetes is certainly a big problem. Uh, if you've had like prostate cancer and you've had a radical prostatectomy, uh, you can certainly have problems post-surgery uh, having erections. So there's a lot of reasons. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it sounds like, and the treatments vary based upon what's going on with you in terms of why you have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And, and like the biggest sex organ apparently is the brain. And so if you have um, a male that has had some bouts of ED, sometimes it can also affect their um, anxiety level about the issue. And yeah. so not, not, it's not just physiological, but it can also become like emotional and psychological. Yeah. And, and well, so let's, okay. That's a good segue because, um, you know, I've heard at talks that part of erectile dysfunction is not just taking medication, but it's having a partner who's a willing partner and all those type of things too. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about how women experience erectile dysfunction. Um, you mean if their spouse has ED? And yeah. How yes, yeah. I, I didn't word that yes. well, but yeah, for a woman who's, whose spouse or partner is having erectile dysfunction issues. Right. So I am like privileged in my clinic to talk about these issues with my, my patients. And so sometimes I hear certain like certain um, vignettes that makes me kind of sad. It makes me sad because, um, you know, the male comes in, uh, he's in a loving relationship and he has ED. And then um, it's, it's because of one of those reasons we just talked about. Maybe he's got diabetes. Maybe he's got maybe he's on three blood pressure medications. Mm -hmm. and, but then he says something like, you know, my wife thinks that I don't find her attractive enough or, um, you know, she feels like I must not love her or maybe even like she thinks I'm cheating on her. Hmm. And it's nothing, nothing to do with that, nothing to do with the wife. And so I feel like I feel like there just needs to be more um, open conversations about about physiological differences and how it affects us um, in the bedroom, too. But. It, I don't want any wife to think or any partner to think that because their spouse is having any form of erectile dysfunction, that it reflects anything on their level of attractiveness and how much he loves her or mm -hmm. him. So anyways, um, so the partner, like usually the patient loves his wife, you know, loves her so much and, and doesn't, you know, wants to have an erection, but just like he just physically can't. And mm -hmm. so it has nothing to do with the wife. And so I just want to make that clear for all the wives that if your partner has ED, it has nothing to do with how attractive he thinks you are. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's just, and it, and it's, it can cause like some sadness uh, in a relationship. If you have the, if you have that kind of slant on the, on the top. Yeah. 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 Right. And uh, so we already talked about one of the causes is low testosterone, I, like in your clinic, um, what, what do you do in terms of treating that? <clears throat> well, first you have to just kind of ask them, what, what are your symptoms? What are your symptoms of low testosterone? It's not just, I can't have an erection. It's like overall fatigue, like maybe cognitive, um, some, maybe some cognitive impairments. I mean, maybe with mood, even like some depression, um, mm -hmm. weight gain, more fat, less muscle mass. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe they're on opioids chronically. Um, maybe they're on antidepressants again. So you want to screen all those things out. And of course, just do a basic blood test. In the morning, a man's testosterone flares up and it's the, the peak in like around eight to 10 in the morning. And so that's when we do their blood test. And we want to confirm it with two blood tests that it's really low. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, I'm guessing these are the shots or patches or those kind of things if you decide someone needs it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what insurance dictates, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's today, right? That's the reality these days. So good. All right. And then uh, the final uh, just physiological men's one that I wanted just to have a chance to talk about. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Peyronie's disease? Sure. Peyronie's disease. And what, what the treatments are and what it is and those type yeah. of things. You may have seen some on commercials nowadays, but Peyronie's disease is when there's a plaque that forms on the penis. Um, and when the male has an erection, the erection is not straight. It curves either up, down, to the side, left or right. And there's um, degrees of the curvature. And if it's like a 10 degree, 20 degree, even 30 degree, um, and it's completely functional, it's, it's it's uh, it's what we call functional curvature, and so you can you can have Peyronie's, um, and still be very functionally active. 
But or you can have very severe peronies and have it like a 90 degree curvature and have it very difficult to have intercourse. So peronies has had a lot of uh, possible treatment options. A lot of them are not effective. Uh, and right now, Zyaflex is, is effective. That is one of the approved treatment options. But then there's also surgical options such as um, grafting, uh, penile prostheses, like incision of the plaque. Um, so that needs a further evaluation. But if you do notice like a firm area on the penis when it's erect, you won't notice it when it's not erect. But when it is erect and it's, and it's an obvious curvature, uh, maybe it wasn't there last year, or maybe it wasn't there, you know, when you were younger, but it's kind of developed. It can be active in the form of where it's actually like still progressing to curve, or it can be stable, like it hasn't changed in a year or so. So that's something that you want to get evaluated. Sure. And in terms of sexual health uh, or sexual relationship for uh, a man and, and a woman, um, Peyronie's and that are, are they mutually exclusive or can it still be everything go well oh, yes you can have uh you can have a healthy um sexual yeah sexual functional life <clears throat> with peyronies but you can also have ed and peyronies so sometimes mm. you just want to tease that out too okay got it okay um so i, I do want to transition here now um and, and obviously for the people that are watching if they have any more men's health questions about physiology of those conditions we've talked about please send those uh, our way and dr song will do our best to answer those, but I did want to kind of delve in more into uh, some women's sexual health questions. So how would you say a, a woman's sexual health differs from a, a male's sexual health, Dr. Song? Well, I think that women's sexual health is such a new topic um, that there's so much to learn and so much to understand about female sexual health. I think for, um, just to go into the differences already is that with the male, we've like really focused on um, his erections and kind of like the functionality of it. But I think for females, there's so much like psychologically and emotionally and like uh, physiologically like involved, all tied together like biologically. So I think the discussion becomes really unique for each woman because, you know, maybe um, maybe there are certain uh, differences. Like, so all women vary, just like we all vary for all other tastes. You know, some people like spicy foods and some people like really bland foods, right? So anyways, I'm just saying, this is another topic that everything varies. Um, and certainly like when people ask like, what's normal, it's kind of hard to answer because every couple is unique and every, um, every person's like desire level is different. Uh, they're, enjoyment factor, their arousal, their history. Um, sometimes, you know, in my clinic, unfortunately, I hear a lot about uh, female sexual abuse, um, some mm -hmm. kind of previous past. So there's like so much involved with female sexual health. Um, and then, but I want to cover like just some basics like, that are yeah. kind of exciting to share too. Um, so I, I got introduced to this topic just maybe within like not, maybe not even two years ago, I was at a female uh, urological conference during the COVID time on Zoom. And one of the doctors, Kelly Kasperson, um, big shout out to her. She gave us this lecture about female sexual health. And there was so many things I learned that that 20 minute lecture that I was shocked that I never knew before. Um, so I thought that was such a great topic. And, and what, are some of the, what are some of the things that you were like, oh, really? Okay. So let's start with the anatomy is uh, the clitoris. You know, the clitoris is one eighth the size of the penis <clears throat> that you can see, but there's so much more of the clitoris that you don't see that I was actually really shocked. Um, I actually, let me see, does this work? I have a diagram here. Yeah. Oh, here it is. Here's the male. So, oh, it's opposite my camera. <laughs> You're doing good. You're doing good. <laughs> this is the part of the penis that you see, right? Right. right. And that's the part that when it's erect, you see it, it, it's right. erect this way, right? But there's a whole part of the penis that you don't see. And I, I knew about that because when we do penile prostheses and we place the penile prostheses, right. we, we implant it all the way to the hip bone. Yeah. So where you, where you sit, those sit bones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I realized, wow, half the length of the penis is actually hidden inside 
the male's pelvis. And that's actually the anchor that brings the penis up. Okay. Because if you have a stable base here, then yeah. the erection goes, you know, upward. Yeah. Base. So that's called the cura, like the legs of the penis. It like goes from the, you know, the head of the head all the way to the hip bones. And now analogous to that. There you go. All right. Yeah. It's obviously the clitoris is smaller, but it's right here. And amazingly, it has double the nerve endings that a penis does. But I always just kind of thought of it right there. You know, mm -hmm. when I do a female exam, it's right above the urethra and yeah. and the clitoral hood. Every female anatomy is very unique and nothing is considered. You, you shouldn't consider what's the normal because mm -hmm. every patient's body is very special. And so you should never try to compare. Um, so the clitoral hood is analogous to the male foreskin. And there's something called even like clitoral phimosis that I never heard about before, but you can have that. If there's any pain there for a female, you can have clitoral phimosis that you want to release. Um, uh, okay. And okay. it's just a 25% of women. And I was like really shocked because, you know, the times I've examined, I never checked for any phimosis of the clitoris. Yeah. But so and even in this diagram, you can only see what's visible and yeah. which is like that little pea sized, yeah. pea sized organ but it actually extends all the way to the size of the pubic symphysis. Okay. It was kind of like a horseshoe. Yeah. Was, Would you hold that up one more time? Oh yeah. So it doesn't just, show the the, the, where's, where's the front and back? Just so, just so folks can kind of see where we're going forward is to your, towards you, towards your face, right? Yeah, sorry, this way where the pubic bone is, where that yeah. bone is right there. Okay. So yeah. is, and then if you want to, so, Oh, and this is the vaginal opening okay. right? right here. This is the vaginal opening. Yeah. This whole entire genital area is called the vulva. Yeah. But a lot of people just call it the vagina. But the vagina is only one part of this. So the vagina is actually the canal that goes this way. That's yeah. the vagina. But You're doing a great job, by the way, with trying to do that with a. Yeah, <laughs> with the screen. True. So yeah. when I say vulva, I would like to be more accurate. And I'm going to say the vulva, which yeah. is the labia majora and the minora and the, the entrance. So here, the vault, the clitoris, the legs of the clitoris can get, extend all the way down and, and to the sides and all the way into like the vaginal opening, kind of mm -hmm. like straddling the vaginal opening. Yeah, both sides. Yes. Yeah. And so you're really seeing just like, like it's like the Titanic, you know, there's just the iceberg. <laughs> and then you get the, so I feel like the clitoris really hasn't gotten much attention. That yeah. Other than that one Seinfeld episode, right? You know, the... <laughs> Wait, I used to watch that. I don't remember it. I must. Oh, you know that he didn't remember the gal's name. What was her name? And kept guessing, and her name was Dolores. Oh, okay, I don't remember. Oh, Sorry. it's a. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Um. So, so, so that's number one. So, like the so the penis has many jobs. You know, it's got to urinate. It's got to ejaculate. It's got to um have an erection. But the female clitoris only has like one job, and that's just pleasure and like sensation. And I feel like even just talking more about just the female, like what gives women pleasure is a really good conversation to start having um, and not just talking about the erection. Sure. So sure. can I just segue into my own little fire away? Okay. So from there, I was really shocked about all the media misinformation out there. So, so, so the talk, the speaker, Kelly Casperson, and then, and then she recommended four books. And I have one of them right here in front of me. Um, this one, I really recommend this one. Come as you are. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they talk about the media message that we get, the medical message that we get, and then the moral message that we get. Like we, as in men and women, but I think women are more sensitive to it, maybe. Mm -hmm. But um, you always see in the media like intercourse as uh, like you know penis and the vagina kind of intercourse, right? And then you think about like the um, you think about how in the media you think, OK, well, they're having great sex because they're both orgasming at the same time. Right. That's kind of what you see. Right. But actually, that's like that's actually very, very far, like the minority of experiences for women. And it talks about how in this book actually talks about how most women, like 70 percent of women cannot orgasm with penis and the vagina sex like that it just doesn't simulate their clitoris and it just doesn't work um 
And so, but in the media, that's kind of what you're kind of held to that standard. You think like, that's just how sex should be. So when I hear like these facts about like, um, you know, 30% of women can maybe orgasm like that, but 70% of women, which is the majority of women will not orgasm like that. And so there's nothing wrong with women if they can't orgasm like that, but it seems like the message is, Hey, you should be able to have sex like right. this and you should be able to have this kind of like media sex, which is, I think completely, completely like unhealthy for a lot of people. Uh, I doesn't, I don't think it helps anything really. And, um, yeah. One more thing is, um, yeah. like the, the porn, the porn industry, I don't know, I don't know much about it, but, but anyways, they, they digitally meet, they digitally, um, enhance the vulva and the vagina and the clitoris or, I'm not sure what they do, but, but apparently like, you know, you don't want people seeing these media images and thinking that that's normal because they're kind of digitally no. enhanced. Okay. Oh, and of course, like not that porn is any standard for anybody. Like, you know, I'm sure they, I don't know. It's just not even the normal person, but, but um, those media messages totally incorrect and wrong, mm. I think are very harmful for people's like sexual health because they should know that that's not normal and they should know that that's not the standard and that, and that um, with a lot of sex researchers and sex therapists and like um, that kind of field, they've kind of talked a lot about about more specifics that help us kind of debunk a lot of myths. Yeah, yeah. So the media kind of keeps going with. Right, right. Yes. Well, I'm glad we're talking about this, Dr. Song, because yeah, you bring up some some really good points. Okay. Um, and. Yeah, we're trying to educate and inform the community and nothing <laughs> from, you know, it's a big part of life. So I'm glad that we're talking about it. Uh, let me ask you something about just like menopause. But what's what's your what have you learned about menopause and how that impacts uh, sexual health for for a woman? Well, well um, I can't speak uh, expertly on menopause. I would refer that I would like defer that to my gynecological colleagues. Yeah, yeah. But when you have menopause, you certainly have a lot of loss of estrogen and you have vaginal dryness that maybe you didn't have when you were younger. Um, so vaginal dryness can really impact um, the comfort uh, of the experience. And so this is my opportunity to tell women about vaginal estrogen. And so they like to promote like any woman over the age of 50, uh, vaginal estrogen, which is a topical like little cream would be very beneficial. And so like women have um, eye cream and face cream and hand cream. Now we just have like vulva cream basically. <laughs> but um, so so it helps to uh, like lubricate and it helps to keep the vaginal tissues healthier. So if there's any woman who's like postmenopause and feeling like yeah. they've got some changes, uh, they can certainly talk to their doctor about vaginal estrogen. Yeah. And what I've read about that, I don't think it really increases your risk of breast cancer or anything like that. It's a small enough dose that you're just, it's mainly helping out with your, with your vagina. Right. There was a, you know, it's, it's nothing to the dose of oral estrogen. And even when you're on oral estrogen, you should also be on vaginal estrogen because your oral estrogen can be taken up in other parts of your body, like your bones, your brain, your other places. And the, and the vagina will be like the last place it will go. So you don't want to, um, you know, you don't want to leave out the vagina. So you want to have direct local cream. And that's why topical vaginal cream is more um, effective in that location than oral estrogen. One of the things that we kind of had a conversation um, before we even we have this interview. And uh, one of the things that you and I were talking about was uh, something called a desire mismatch in relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, can, you want to talk about that a little bit, Dr. Song? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, you know, of course in my clinic, I hear it a lot. Like, you know, the guy wants to have a lot of sex. The woman doesn't want to have a lot of sex. And I think that's like the typical, but there are women that actually sometimes like their sex drive is higher and the male, their sex drive is lower. So I don't want to, it's not, it's not like, you know, I mean, there's, like I said, like you said there's a continuum of, of, for all of us. Yeah. So it's, it's not just that, you know, but, but generally that's kind of what you hear. Right. Yeah. So, when you have somebody with high desire and then you have somebody with low desire, our cultural understanding is, oh, there's something wrong with this low desire person. But in actuality, like, no, that's not how, that's not, that's not the healthy way to think about it. And when you have this desire mismatch, which I think from my clinic, I hear it a lot. So I would say majority of couples have a desire mismatch. Um, 
you try to bring the desire, like maybe this high person down and this low person up to kind of meet in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that that desire is a huge topic. And, you know, I think if you had more um, partners interested in, okay, well, what makes my partner have more desire? Then that's a great question to ask. Not like, why doesn't my partner want to have sex with me? Like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think, so another element, another like, uh, you know, idea that was brought about from this book is like women have accelerators and then breaks. So accelerators are like, okay, you know, we just went on a great date. You know, everyone's in the mood. You feel really good. There's no kids in the house, that kind of thing. So accelerators mean we're going to probably have sex, right? But then breaks are, there's like too many dishes that haven't been done. The laundry's not folded. Maybe like, you know, there's a baby in the other room. Like those are breaks. And so women have a combination of accelerators and breaks that I think if their partner may be asked about, like what helps you, you know, versus just like, you know, that may get more uh, fruitful conversation. That because, mismatch may kind of come a little bit closer. Right. And it's like, you know, there's in that, that trust and that real, re like you want to be relaxed and you want to have trust that kind of will be more fruitful. Um, and so um, I think that, because each woman, you know, they have their own set of accelerators and set of, of breaks. You want to kind of figure out what, where, where, where she is. And some women have a lot of acceleration and some women have a lot of breaks. And so mm -hmm. it, it, it really depends on their history and um, what helps them. Yeah. Good. I appreciate that answer. And then I wanted to talk about another one too. It, it, and that is something called arousal non-concordance. Yeah. I want to, I want to give you a chance to, to talk a little bit about that too. Yeah. So I read this study, um, this in this, um, so it was talking about how, you know, they had a group of men, they had like an elastic band around their penis to kind of measure their erection rate. And they were given images like on, you know, in a room by themselves to measure. And so they were given plenty of different images that, that would cause maybe some or an arousal, like either, I don't, I don't want to go into the details, but, and then, they did that for women too. Okay. So you were kind of, you were doing a subjective testing. Okay. You were asking their brain, like, okay, what aroused you? And then you were looking at their penis, like what aroused the penis? Okay. And so. So you're looking at the clitoris to see how it, what makes it get. Yeah. Or like vaginal, it was like some kind of vaginal tightening. Secretion. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All that kind of stuff there. Yeah. Okay. okay. When you talk about secretion, we got to talk about that too, because, okay. um, because, so you think, you know, if a male's penis is getting hard or he's getting erect, you think, oh, he must be aroused, right? Like his brain must be turned on, but it found that the study showed that only 50%, like 50, half, hmm. half of their time, the penis was up that they were like physically, like mentally aroused. Okay. So that's that arousal non-concordance so one of those myths is oh he's got an erection he must be turned on and he must want to have sex right but that's actually not true hmm. maybe it's true half the time but the other half the time so i'll give you an example like may um you know when they sleep they go through rem and during rem they have this nocturnal tumescence you know a male uh you know morning erections right so when they wake up in the morning it's not that they necessarily want to have sex. They just have an erection. So they have an erection, but they're not like in the mood. So think like separate brain. And then you think penis, what they're doing, like genital and penis and the brain. Right now let's do Let's go to the woman. Um, so the woman, she sees all these media images and they're measuring her like genital response. And then she's subjectively saying what actually aroused her. So her concordance, it was not 50%. Mm. It was only 10 percent okay okay so you can't tell like so basically it's like why was that why did her genitals respond and why did her brain say like you know why was so if there's only a 10 percent concordance um there's just more going on in like a female like psychological emotional um thought process that like the brain filtering all these things but their genitals will just kind of be very good at detecting what's what's sexually relevant. But mm -hmm. their brain may say, 
it's sexually relevant, but I'm not into it, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. So okay. maybe they will have like vaginal secretions. Maybe they will get, you know, be, get wet, but maybe they're still not into it. Mm. And so that was just an interesting thing to learn yeah. about on both aspects, you know, so for male and women for, for yes, for male. So, um, when, so here's like, uh, apparently one of the vignettes in this book was like, you know, a boyfriend thought a female that she wasn't, that her, that his, his girlfriend wasn't ready because she wasn't wet, but, but in actuality, she was really ready. Like her brain mm. was like, really, she was ready. Mm. Like, oh no, you're not ready because you're not wet. So that's, let's just break that myth. So that's, that's the arousal non-concordance. So it's better to listen to what the female is saying to you than to, than to um, like, you know, gauge how she's feeling yeah. with general response. And that's also with a male too, I guess that's for females to know, hey, if a guy just has an erection, maybe he just has an erection, not because he's, and, and, and this is another vignette was really kind of scary was like when you see images like that, you don't want to see like, you know, something like violent or something. And then suddenly a male gets an erection. It's not because he's turned on by it. It's because his genitals are responding to, hey, that's a sexually relevant issue. But it doesn't mean that his brain like mm -hmm. necessarily is agreeing with whatever he's seeing. So I want to, you know, make it clear both ways. But the male generally has a 50% concordance, like, and a, generally a female only has 10%. So really there's just like so many different levels like the female has, you know, she's got all those breaks going on. She's got like some filters. She's got the, a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. well, I don't say I got it, but I, I'm hearing what you're saying. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I, yeah. 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 Um, well, good. I'm glad we've had a chance to, I would say that this is just the beginning of that conversation for folks. Um, and I think Dr. Song and myself would both encourage people to have conversations about these things with their mm -hmm. spouses or significant mm -hmm. others, um, cause it's an important part of life. And if you talk about it, it's more likely to be a fulfilling one. Yeah. And, and I, I do just, just to talk about my clinic, I really feel like there's so much, um, connection that happens when a couple is intimate, but then there's also so much like sorrow that can happen when they're, mm -hmm. when they're not. And so I think it is a really important well being topic. Um, and so, I do recommend, um, I'm not a sex therapist at all. And there are professional sex therapists uh, that I'm, I'm not sure if there's any locally, but there's certainly people that you can follow on Instagram or Facebook. And like I said, Kelly Casperson is a really good um, uh, resource. And um, I do recommend those books that she recommended to me. Yeah. So speaking so, of those, Dr. Song, yeah. we're going we're gonna to put links up to those. Okay. I don't know if Maddie may even put them up now, but we definitely will have them on our um, on our Facebook live site so that people if they're interested in, in exploring this further can can look at that can access that material and I, I did get a chance to look at some of the stuff that Dr. Song had recommended and yeah it's very uh, first of all that come as you are book is a is a good book um, mm -hmm. and then the um, and then this this gal who's actually a urologist herself yeah um, mm -hmm. and then there was another sex therapist that you'd recommended who has she and her husband have a on Instagram and do a lot of work with that. So mm -hmm. I'm glad we've had a chance to have this conversation. Okay, great. Are you? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm, I, just, I think it should just be more awareness about this topic. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Maybe it'll be one of the foundations next year's um, <laughs> drives. We're laughing. Maybe it should be. I don't know. Uh, well, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's an important part of life too. So. Sounds Dr. Good. Song, as always, a uh, pleasure to have you on here, uh, Facebook Live with me. And um, thank you for, for all you do here at CGH and taking care of our patients. You're welcome. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. All right. So that's our Facebook Live broadcast for this week. I, I'm pretty sure we're coming back the first week of July, and I'm pretty sure we're going we're gonna to talk about feet with Dr. Riley. I hope I have that right. Anyhow, we'll have it posted on Facebook so you can take a look and see. Hey, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this broadcast. If you found it in informative or helpful, I encourage you to, to show it, uh, to, to share it with those that you know. And I also just wish all of you to have a healthy and a safe uh, couple weeks. 
and I will be uh, here on Facebook Live uh, soon. So until then, thank you and, and goodbye.